Hello, we are on the third reading of The One and Only Bob by Katherine Applegate, and we are starting with Click. And if you remember in our last reading, we were uh, Bob was telling us how he does not like cars, trucks, anything like that, and we can remember from our first story the terrible thing that happened to him from the truck and why we know he doesn't like trucks or cars. This is called Click. That's when they started clicker training me. Click, here's a treat. Come closer to the car, Bob. Click, here's a treat. Watch while I open the car door, Bob. Click, here's a treat. Come right up to the seat, Bob. Click, here's a treat. Come on in, Bob. Bob? Bob, where are you, Bob? Yeah, it was like that a lot. Options. Still haven't been in a car, or a truck or a tractor for that matter. When I have to go to the rhymes with pet, with pet threat, Julia and her parents walk me there. They say uh, elephants have long memories. Well, so do dogs, people. I'm not, it's not like I'm afraid. I'm just exercising my options. This is called full wag. Are you ready to head over to the park? George asks as he passes through the living room. He's carrying two flashlights and a roll of masking tape. Yep, Julia says, and I do a head tilt to show I'm intrigued by the conversation. The place where Ivan and Ruby live is called Wild World Zoological Park and Sanctuary, but everybody just calls it the park. George works at the park as head groundskeeper, which means I've got some sway, and everybody who's employed there loves Julia. Give me a minute. I just need to grab my coat, says George. Straight home after that, though, Julia, says Sarah, just in case the weather gets worse. One minute the weatherman's saying we're going to have a little shower. Next minute it's the storm of the century. Julia scratches my head. I thought Hurricane Gus wasn't coming till tomorrow. Sometimes they change course, says Sarah. They can be unpredictable. You know, George says with a wink, in the old days, they only named hurricanes after women. Julia groans. Oh, that's so sexist. It's not just the wind that I'm worried about on this one, George says. It's the storm surge that could be a problem. Flooding. Julia tries to make me wear her mom's latest creation, a knitted dog sweater with security written on it, which I suppose is an ironic reference to my petite size. I politely decline. All right, you win, Julia sighs. Ready for your walk, Bob? At the mention of the word walk, I go crazy mutt, so it's clear I'm on board with the idea. I think there's a picture of crazy mutt up here. Nope. Humans love it when we get silly. I think they're so weighed down by people problems that sometimes they need to be reminded what happy looks like. Julia attaches my string. I try for a little tug of war, but she refuses to buy it. Let's go see Ivan and Ruby, she says. Just hearing those names sends my tail into full wag. Good words, bad words. I've never met a dog who didn't like a big old grin on his kisser when walks slipped into a conversation. Dogs understand more than you might think. The Nature Channel says we're about as smart as the average human toddler. Two-year-olds, my fuzzy rump, were a million times brainier than some babbling rug rat. There was a dog on that Man's Best Friend show who supposedly understood like a thousand human words. Border Collie, I think. Those guys need to, those guys need to switch to decaf. The narrator was gushing about this wonder dog, and I'm like, well, duh, Brainiac, of course we understand people. Not everything, mind you, and some of us are more attentive than others. Depends a lot on just how interesting your humans happen to be. Certain words will really cause our ears to perk up. The classics, treat, walk, frisbee, bacon, and don't forget the swear words, vet, bath, fireworks, vacuum cleaner. We always hear those. Clock versus moon. Julia and I wait by the front door while George says goodbye to Sarah. I think maybe the hardest thing for me about being domesticated, a pet if you insist, is that I can't control my own schedule. If I had my way, I'd hang out with Ivan and Ruby all day, every day. Unfortunately, humans love their clocks. Dogs, we use the sky to tell time, like any sensible creature. Sky says it's dawn, time to eat. It's noon, time to eat. It's afternoon, time to eat. It's dusk, time to eat. It's midnight, time to eat. Point is, it's always time to eat. Dogs have a thing for the moon, too, like wolves and coyotes and our other relatives. No calendars for us. Moon looks like a claw. Moon looks like half a pancake. Moon looks like a tennis ball. Moon looks like, like, looks like a claw again. A chunk of time has passed. But humans, nope, that's not enough. It's not a chunk, it's a month. It's not just dawn, it's 6.32 a.m. on a Thursday, and boy, oh boy, we better hurry up and go to school or the office or change the baby. But who gives a wolf about feeding the poor, starving, sad-eyed, grumbling, tummy dog? After a spell, I got used to the comings and goings of Julia and her mom and dad, but it keeps changing. Julia leaves early for school and, it's, and is gone most of the day. She returns home excited and energized, good sense mostly, but every now and then she comes back smelling a little like me after a visit to the dog trainer, battle-weary and ready to crawl under the covers. Sarah, who was pretty sick for a while, is feeling fine again, thank goodness, but she went back to work and she's away all day too, and George, who has a job at Ivan's place, works five, sometimes six days a week. 
That means it's just me and the guinea pigs a lot of the time. I have a doggy door and an outside run, but it's not the same as touring the neighborhood with your person. Peeing without a potential audience is like talking to yourself. Sometimes I'm the teeniest bit jealous of Ivan and Ruby. They always have someone around. Which is crazy, I know. I'm free and they're not, but there it is. Told you, I'm not a saint. This is called The Shelter, and there they are, Julia and Bob. I know our route to Ivan and Ruby by heart, and I can't help tugging a bit, even though I'm not supposed to. It's been a couple days since I've seen my pals, and I need my friend fix like I need air and water and belly rubs. We don't live far. Down to the end of the street, around a corner, good news source there, then a few more blocks. When I walk Julia, well, okay, I suppose it's supposed to look like she's walking me, but I beg to differ. There's a place we pass that always makes me jumpy and bummed. It's the animal shelter, and I know it's a good place, a space for pets who don't have a safe home of their own. When I was abandoned on the highway just a few weeks old, a nice cage with a soft towel in it and a bowl of fresh water, well, I would have given just about anything for that. Still, when I walk by and hear all those desperate barks and meows and squeaks, it gets to me. Sometimes having great hearing is a pain. Thing is, I realize I have a home and the gang in there doesn't, and I try not to think about stuff like that, you know? I mean, it's not like I can do anything about their tough breaks, right? And in fairness, maybe those animals aren't like me. I've always been a resilient, hardworking sort. Maybe some of those guys even made their own bad luck. Don't get me wrong, I try to be a nice guy. I do what I can to make the world a better place, sure. Chat with the guinea pigs, lick the strawberry jelly off Julia's hand, do my wagon dance when the rents come home to make them feel good. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. But it's like I said before, you gotta look out for numero uno. Guess that's why the shelter harshes my mellow. It's just, you know, I'd rather not have to hear those guys every time I walk by. It makes me sad. Reminds me of the bad old days. This is called Drooliest. I knew this guy back when I hung out at the mall with Ivan and Ruby. Nice dog named Drulius. Basic mutt, maybe some lab and golden in there somewhere. He'd done some hard time at a couple shelters. One of those dogs you know had seen more than his share of the bad stuff the world can throw your way. One ear bitten off, scars, a limp. Drulius lived in his backyard. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Chained up, mostly. Flies on his food. Empty water bowl way too often. That is just terrible. I can't stand hearing stuff like that. Still, he always had a nice word to say when I'd pass him on my daily rounds, checking out the neighborhood trash cans. Once I saw his owner, again, that word, step onto the back porch. Drulius was barking, but he had a good reason. A stranger had just passed by. Barking's what we're supposed to do in that circumstance, right? Maybe he's the UPS guy. Maybe he's a serial killer. I mean, come on, we're not the FBI. So anyway, his owner came out, big guy, mean looking, gave Drulius a hard kick with his boot, yelled, shut up, you fool then disappeared. Julius looked at me, kind of embarrassed. We kept talking. A few minutes later, the owner came out again, put some towels on a line. Julius headed over, tail between his legs, cowering, saying, I'm sorry, I love you, I'm yours, 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 with his whole dog being. Guy completely ignored him, headed back inside. He's having a tough time, said Julius, when the guy was gone. He's a jerk, I said, because subtlety is not my strong point. No, he loves me, he does. Well, he has a funny way of showing it. Humans, said Drulius, licking a sore on his leg. You know how they can be. Do I ever. But we got to stay true. Love them. Forgive them. I thought about that. Thought about it a lot. Why, though, I finally asked. Why do we have to forgive them? Drulius looked shocked, then confused, as if I just asked why cheese tastes good. It just does. That's just the way it is, he said. That's what we do, Bob. I started to reply, but I managed to hold my tongue, which is not easy for me. It's a very long tongue with a mind of its own. There was no point in making Julius feel worse than he already did. Later that morning, I found half a turkey sandwich. Gave the whole thing to him. Well, okay, I had a taste first, but still. Called forgiveness. Seems like forgiving humans is one of those doggy things we're all supposed to do, like having zoomies or doing dog, be dog boogies. Bed boogies. I have a hard time saying that. Bed boogies. It's written into our canine souls. Well, somehow I didn't get the memo, the one that apparently went out to every other dog on the planet about forgiveness. Why should I forgive the humans who tossed me and my siblings out into the night? When you forgive, you lose your anger. And when you lose your anger, you get weak. And when you're weak, you can get hurt all over again. This is the art of human watching. By the time we reach the park, the sky is definitely in a bad mood. Gray clouds galloping like panicked horses. The nervous scent of rain on the way. The kind that makes you antsy in your own skin. When we get near the employee entrance, I hop into Julia's backpack like always. We enter through the special gate where George shows his ID, checks in, and says hi to the staff. Pet dogs aren't allowed at the park. 
Natch, foxes, wolves, jackals, my dog cousins, they are. But in my opinion, even though they're technically part of my extended family, they're nothing like dogs. Only dogs have perfected the art of human watching. The smartest thing we ever did was figure out how important the human gaze is. So often when we follow our owner's eyes, we're rewarded with something amazing. A smelly sock, a glazed donut, a glazed donut that's fallen on a smelly sock. We follow every blink, every sidelong glance. We see it, whatever it is, before humans do. We understand before they do. And if there's a glazed donut involved, we eat it before they do. This is called puppy eyes. It's mid-morning, still pretty early. There aren't many visitors around yet. We've got a meeting in 20, George tells a couple workers, Hank and Sonia, who groan. Just a quick one, going over contingency plans one last time in case there's any flooding. During the last hurricane, a small part of the park flooded, mostly near Reptileville. George helped move cages. He came home smelling like cotton mouths and copperheads. It was all I could do not to barf. <laughs> Weather service just issued a tornado watch, Hank says. I thought we were having a hurricane, Julia says. We are, Gus, but sometimes tornadoes are spawned during hurricanes, George explains. Julia frowns. But a watch means maybe not for sure, right? Yeah, but I want you to head home, George says, just in case. Please, Dad, just ten minutes, Julia says. She's using the special voice she reserves for moments when she really, really wants something from her parents. I guess kids manipulate their moms and dads the same way dogs manipulate humans. I don't know, George begins. I promised Bob. I figure that's my cue to pop my head out and look adorable, so I do. Hey, Bob, says Hank. Sonia reaches over and scratches my ears. I'm pretty popular around the park. I give George my best puppy eyes, and he caves. Ten minutes tops, he says. Meet me back here. Puppy eyes. Works every time. This is called Mr. Oog. Here's how I figure puppy eyes got their start. Cave humans were sitting around a fire wearing mammoth fur and grunting about how there was nothing on TV because TV hadn't been invented yet, and some wily wolf thought, whoa, they've got leftover mammoth meat. And he probably whimpered and cowered and did a tummy display and looked pathetic enough that Mr. Oog finally tossed him a bone. And soon enough, a few zillion years later, voila, man's best friend. After all that time, there's a thing, like a magnetic attraction between dogs and humans. We've studied them for so long we can read every twitch and sigh. Suppose it was easier than chasing down mammoths. And I get it. I do. The behind the ears scratch, the food in a fancy bowl, the bed by the fireplace. Gotta admit that Julia's pretty fun to hang out with. And I'm grateful, really I am, that her family took me in. Still, I don't need them. You need someone, eventually they let you down, and you end up feeling like a real doofus. This is called the park. As Julia walks, I sneak peeks out of her backpack, like I always do. There you can see him. We pass the meerkat family, poking out from their den holes like a whack-a-mole game they used to have at Max Mall. I see the flashy flamingos with their one-legged balancing act, and the terrifyingly beautiful tigers. Even their cute cubs give me the willies, though. Families I've noticed take a lot of different shapes. Jim and Joe, the penguins, adopted an abandoned egg, and they are the sweetest doting parents you ever saw. I see it with humans at the park, too. Families of all shapes and sizes and colors and genders, and yep, they all seem to do just fine. We round a corner past Sea Otter Alley. Oliver and Olivia are floating calmly on their backs, holding each other's paws. It's pretty adorable, I have to admit. But me, I don't need the trouble that comes with family. Babies puking, toddlers whining, spouses nagging. Talk about a design flaw. This is called change. The park's pretty big. Lots of twisty paths and fascinating smells. All the parts have names. There's the African aviary, the outback, penguin cove, lemur land. It's like puzzle pieces of the world. A little Africa here, a little Asia there. Dogs, you can find us pretty much everywhere. Our territory is Earth, as long as we're hooked up with humans, that is. Along the shady paths, volunteer guides will answer your questions. They'll tell you about how animals used to roam one part of the world or another until things changed. Things change. That's one thing I figured out. Don't ever assume a little patch of the planet belongs to you. Things change. Boxes go flying. And again, that's a reference to him, his box flying out of the truck. This is called my inner wolf. On our way, we always stop by the wolf habitat. Julia loves wolves, probably because they remind her of me. You have to look hard, maybe squint a little, but if you try, you can catch a hint of my inner wolf. It's in the eyes, mostly. Also in my distinguished profile. I dream I'm a wolf sometimes, and when I wake up, I'm panting, and my fur's on alert, and I'm feeling, yeah, the world could hurt me, but I could hurt the world, world right back even harder. Like there's a dangerous hard part of me chained inside, struggling to go free and just, I don't know, get even. Then I go see what's for breakfast.
let's see if we should stop there. Yeah, we'll stop there and we'll start our next reading with Kimu.